So that is how it is. I mean, uh, we need to identify uh, the agents to properly. So as far as uh, uh, this thing, uh, the different agents are concerned, basically, uh, NSAIDs are, uh, you know, these are either cyclooxygenase inhibitors and uh, basically these are non-selective agents and uh, uh, it has a competitive inhibition of cyclooxygenase and uh, it has a major role in inflammatory uh, cascade. It prevents the inflammatory reaction which is triggered due to um, pain. Uh, okay, so some of these uh, NSAIDs also have anticoagulation effect. Uh, and it, it can also lead to antiplatelet, uh, sorry, thrombocytopenia. And then in patients with the renal failure, especially in patients with these sept sepsis or septic shock or hypovolemic patients, inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis in the kidneys, uh, there will be hypoperfusion of the kidneys and pa patients will develop renal failure. It also has high risk of GI bleeding NSAIDs because it causes GI ulceration and these ulcers can bleed and can lead to torrential gastrointestinal bleeding. And it should be contraindicated in patients with bronchial asthma because it inhibits a beta-2 agonist and probably is not due to histamine release, but due to prostaglandin uh, you know, uh, uh, inhibition, uh, some of these patients may also have bronchospasm. So it may be... Uh, uh, one of asthmatic patients are very sensitive to NSAIDs. So, which are the different NSAIDs that we use? I mean, Ketorolac, which was earlier popular, is now not, uh, uh, you know, in use much uh, by, except by the dentists and orthopedicians. But diclofenac is quite used. You know, it can be used in rectal suppositories uh, in form 25 to 50 milligrams. But by, by and large, diclofenac is also awarded in ICU because these analgesics have a better efficacy where the patients have skin soft tissue related injuries and the pain is because of that. Opioids have efficacy better of when the patient has visceral pain, abdominal pain, visceral injuries, okay? So in this situation, the opioid will be better, but for skin soft tissue, uh, but for skin soft tissue injury and uh, uh, for uh, uh, bone, uh, this So, it uh, has been uh, abused uh, for quite a lot of times, uh, especially, you know, if the patient is taking diclofenac for a long time, uh, these patients will develop uh, renal failure and GI ulceration and patients are presented with uh, peptic ulceration and GI bleed and this can also lead to a GI emergency also. So whenever the and the diclofenac also has been associated with bronchospasm, especially when it has been used in patients with the asthma. So it has to be used judiciously. The safest NSAID that we call it as like acetaminophen, uh, but it is only useful in patients with a mild pain. But it can be combined with opioids, especially for moderate to severe pain. And the analgesic effect uh, can be, you know, uh, increased, uh, especially when it is used with opioid. The opioid requirement can also be reduced and, and probably the NSAID requirement can also go down if it has it is used in combination. And then uh, it, uh, it has a notoriously, uh, you know, harmful effects uh, in the form of hepatotoxicity, paracetamol toxicity is quite common and in European countries you will see patients presenting with paracetamol toxicity eventually leading requiring a liver transplantation. So, so the dose range is basically not beyond 4 grams, but about 10 grams, these patients will develop hepatotoxicity and these patients will uh, need uh, liver transplantations later. There
so uh, uh, I, I, you know if at all the, it has to be used uh, you know the dose range can be uh, up to 4 gram it has to be restricted you know up to 4 grams uh, but some patients who have uh, poor nutritional status uh, even in in these patients the dose requirement can also be reduced okay it, it has to be less than 4 gram per day so if the patient has significant alcohol intake or patient has alcohol uh, induced cirrhosis or liver dysfunction so uh, these patients uh, should not take paracetamol more than 2 grams per day otherwise the hepatotoxicity will be precipitated in these patients okay so uh, whenever the patient has a, a paracetamol toxicity you know we should follow up with the drug levels of the paracetamol and uh, you know the detoxification can be achieved with uh, uh, n acetyl cysteine but as far as possible if we restrict the dosages okay up to 4 grams and in alcoholic disease liver disease we restrict it up to 2 grams so that's the best strategy okay so um, uh, what is more important is how to use these uh, agents so majority of the times what happens we give these agents when the patient already has got pain but we should be able to predict and preemptively if you give these analgesics we call it as preemptive analgesia so in this situation the drug dosage requirement can also be substantially reduced and if the patient has established pain and if you try using these painkillers, they may not be effective initially and later on be overdo with the painkillers and leading to toxicity and all that. So that's why uh, whenever needed, we should use these agents, you know, preemptively, okay, without any delay in the treatment. So if the patient has pain, you know, if the pain, pain call is being activated, so within 30 minutes, the pain should be relieved. Okay, so like for a stroke protocol, the patient should be thrombolyzed within, uh, for heart, MI, for patient has to be thrombolyzed within 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Okay, uh, you know, as early as possible, we see. Similarly for pain. Okay, uh, the patient complains of pain, it has to be relieved as early as possible within 30 minutes and then only able to uh, take care of uh, the patient's, uh, you know, analgesic requirement later on. The continuous infusion versus intermittent uh, dosages. So in intermittent dosages, you know, you have to give boluses and sometimes, you know, the bolus dose, the effect may take some time and then we end up giving dosages after dosages. So initially bolus dose and later on, if you continue into a continuous infusion, uh, which will give sustained pain relief, that is the best strategy rather than just going continuously but without giving bolus so these patients will take long time to achieve uh, the therapeutic uh, effect of uh, the analgesic agent so that's why i mean there is a role for patient controlled analgesia okay so in pa patients who are not critically ill uh, so stable patients and uh, those patients who want a good quality of analgesia and you want to reduce sedation agents and less opioid consumption uh, and we want to avoid uh, drug toxicities and adverse effects of the drugs, then patient controlled analgesia can be advocated. We can feel pre-filled pre cassettes of the drugs are available and then we have a dose limit set for opioid suppose 10 mics. Every time when the patient is you know pushing, uh, we, we, we draw a safety limit and uh, 10 micrograms dose is given. Similarly, if we have added any other analgesic agent and we monitor, <clears throat> we make sure that only one tenth of the drug dosages requirement is given to the boluses when the patient is using patient control analgesia. That will prevent drug toxicity and patient will also be able to control his pain as and when required. So that's why patient control analgesia, the drug requirement can also be reduced if these are used in this fashion. So the routes of administration are either intravenous, intramuscular and transdermal, oral, rectal, even, even epidural uh, drug doses, the routes are, uh, you know, used. But intramuscular is not recommended nowadays, especially patients with coagulopathy or septic patient, because that can lead to sepsis, cellulitis, uh, sepsis, cellulitis. And 
So basically, uh, patients um, uh, with um, uh, intramuscular uh, roots, uh, in which the intramuscular root was used for analgesia, these patients have developed gangrenous changes, necrotizing fasciitis, cellulitis, with uh, unsterile syringes, so the needles when it has been used, a lot of patients have developed these problems, especially and. And if the patient is coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, these patients will again have a hematoma or bleeding risk associated with that. So that's why it is very essential that intramuscular root should be avoided. Epidural root can also be used, which is good enough, you know, in which we will be able to use local anesthetic agent and opioid can also be used. A combination of local anesthetic agent like lignocaine or sensorcaine, okay, which is also called as BPVacaine. If BPVacaine uh, in, you know, analgesic dosages is used along with the opioids uh, that will give excellent pain relief. And then the complications associated with the NSAIDs and the opioids can also be prevented. And it can be used in continuous infusion. The dosages with the epidural can be adjusted in such a way that the toxicity is also monitored. And then uh, there are other routes like transdermal patches, like fentanyl patches can also give be uh, used for control of uh, pain. And uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, rectal suppositories are also available, especially diclofenac rectal suppository uh, can be very useful in which uh, we will be able to uh, reduce the systemic toxicity because the, the local absorption uh, will bypass the liver metabolism and the drug toxicity, the drug requirement can also be reduced. Uh, if we uh, use the rectal preparations. So as far as benzodiazepines are concerned, benzodiazepines will be excellent for relieving the anxiety and it promotes amnesia and sedation. And its effect is mediated by GABA receptors. Okay, you know, so basically its effect is mediated by decreasing the limbic system, which is involved uh, with the GABA receptor complex. And then midazolam uh, can be used in the, you know, uh, with the uh, onset of action, two to five minutes, lower as a little long acting, five to 20. Mm -hmm. The onset of action sir, is five to 20 minutes. Sir, sorry to interrupt, the slides are not visible. Are you able to see the slides now? No, sir. Since when the slides are not uh, just, visible? Just now, sir. Like, uh, now, it's, now it is visible, sir. Just now it's visible, no? Yeah. So as, as far as the benzodiazepines is concerned, the midazolam is the shortest acting uh, uh, sedative agent. But if it has been it has been used in continuous infusion, it can have uh, uh, prolonged context uh, uh, half life, and uh, it can have prolonged sedation because midazolam gets accumulated in the fatty tissues, and then it takes long time from these fatty tissues to come out into circulation, and then uh, you know. Even if you stop the midazolam infusion, these patients will remain drowsy and uh, sedated for a long time. So that's why whenever we are using midazolam, uh, it has to be used in uh, probably uh, the sedation score has to be monitored. Sedation, agitation, uh, Richmond agitation score, Ramsey sedation score can also be used for uh, monitoring the sedation score of the patient. Okay, and these are the drug dosages. So lorazepam is basically, um, you know, uh, metabolized by glucuronidization, where the metazolam is uh, metabolized by oxidation. Uh, lorazepam has prolonged action half life. Uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the half life is around 8 to 15 hours, and it, it has uh, uh, complications like acidosis, especially in patients with their renal failure if it is used in high doses. And diazepam. Uh, gets meta metabolized by dismethylation and hydroxylation and it has prolonged sedative effect. It causes phlebitis, it causes pain uh, in the injection site and it has the prolonged half-life 20 to 120 hours also. So earlier, uh, it, it used to be used in you know ventilated patients in the ICU, but now the uh, usage of diazepam has been reduced because the better preparations like metazolam have been available and the toxicity uh, of uh, the midazolam is less compared to diazepam. So if we, if the patient has acute agitation, midazolam will be very, very useful because its onset of action is within two to five minutes. Okay. And then uh, alpha hydroxy midazolam is the active form of midazolam. 
Lorazepam is the onset of action is five to twenty minutes, but it is not useful in acute agitational state. Okay, uh, but make sure that it has prolonged uh, um, half life, and it is difficult to titrate, especially when we use in the continuous infusions. It is difficult to titrate, and uh, it has its own problem of solvent related acidosis, uh, and then uh, these are the uh, problems because polyethylene glycol. Uh, polyylene, um, polyylene glycol. Uh, these are the solvents which are used, which can cause acute tubular necrosis and lactic acidosis in patients. Uh